With joyful hearts and renewed faith in God, the victorious armies of Israel had returned from Bashan. They had already gained possession of valuable territory and they were confident of the immediate conquest of Canaan. Sometimes we are overconfident. Only the Jordan River lay between them and the Promised Land. Just across the river was a rich plain covered with verdure, watered with streams from copious fountains and shaded by luxuriant palm trees. Can you see this picture? They were looking at this. Ah, oh, are we going to be there? On the western border of the plain rose the towers and palaces of Jericho. So embosomed in its palm tree groves that it was called the city of palm trees. On the eastern side of Jordan, between the river and the high tableland, which they had been traversing, was also a plain. It was several miles or kilometers in width and extended quite a long distance along the river. This is where they settled, waiting to cross over. This picture shows you what it looked like from the air, the green. This sheltered valley had the climate of the tropics. Here flourished the shittim, or acacia tree, giving the plain the name Vale of Shittim. It was here that the Israelites encamped, and in the acacia groves by the riverside they found an agreeable retreat. We love agreeable retreats. They were there. But amid these attractive surroundings, they were to encounter an evil more deadly than mighty hosts of armed men or the wild beasts of the wilderness. What could this enemy be? Is there something that I should learn from this warning, this enemy? That country so rich in natural advantages had been defiled by its inhabitants. In the public worship of Baal, the leading deity, the most degrading and iniquitous scenes were constantly enacted. This was, this was terrible. This was terrible. Explaining sex. That's, that's what, what happened here. On every side were places noted for idolatry and licentiousness. These two always went together. Idolatry and licentiousness. This was the attraction of ancient worship. Licentiousness and idolatry. The very names being suggestive of the vileness and corruption of the people. Oh, my friend, God wants pure people. Their minds became familiar with the vile thoughts constantly suggested. And it all happened here next to the Jordan River where you're looking at. The life of ease produced its demoralizing effect. Don't be too comfortable on this planet. Almost unconsciously to themselves, they were departing from God and coming into a condition where they would fall an easy prey to temptation. The song says, Lead, yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Flee from temptations. During the time of the encampment beside Jordan, Moses was preparing the occupation of Canaan. It was here that he wrote the book of Deuteronomy, a beautiful book. In this work, the great leader was fully employed. Oh, please, if you haven't read Deuteronomy, read it. It's fascinating. But to the people, this time of suspense and expectation was most trying. And before many weeks had elapsed, the history was marred by the most frightful departures from virtue and integrity. Parallel to worshipping the golden calf, about the same. At first there was little intercourse between the Israelites and the heathen neighbours. 
But after a time, the Midianitish woman began to steal into the camp. Man, they've never seen such beautiful ladies. Huh. Their appearance excited no alarm, and so quietly were their plans conducted that the attention of Moses was not called to the matter. It was the object of these women in their association with the Hebrews to seduce them into transgression of the law of God, to draw their attention to heathen rites and customs and lead them into idolatry. Be careful. The enemy of deception is brilliant. He leads you slowly away from God and destroys you. These motives were studiously concealed under the garb of friendship so that they were not suspected even by the guardians of the people. Deception is so dangerous. At Balaam's suggestion, we back at Balaam, a grand festival in honor of their gods was appointed by the king of Moab. You should have seen the advertisement. It was secretly arranged that Balaam should induce the Israelites to attend. Maybe he said to them, we're going to have a feast of God. Singular, it was God's. Curses of Balaam in the museum. Great numbers of the people joined him in witnessing the festivities. Come along, let's enjoy the feast. Watch out for enjoyments. He was regarded by them as a prophet of God and hence had little difficulty in accomplishing his purpose. Man, he spoke about God and he said, I'm inviting you, a man of God, to come to this feast. Watch out for invitations to certain feasts. They ventured on forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan. Beguiled with music, watch out for music, and dancing, can you see the ladies dancing? And allured by the beauty of heathen virgins. They only had the beauty queens in this great deception. They cast off their fidelity and obedience to God. Hmm. Can the devil use music to destroy our morals? Great research has been done in this field. Can the composers of hard metals be influenced by the devil? A picture. As they united in mirth and feasting, indulgence in wine beclouded their senses and broke down the barriers of self-control. You know, I visited the uh, Bacchus temple at Baalbek. Bacchus is the god of wine. When people attended the services at Bacchus, they gave them wine, intoxicate them, and then led them into sensual sins. Alcohol is dangerous. Passion at full sway, and having defiled their consciences, by lust, they were persuaded to bow down to idols. First they were intoxicated, then persuaded by lust, the ladies around there, and then they bowed down to the idols. They offered sacrifice upon heathen altars. Oh, can you believe it? And participated in the most degrading rites. You know, I watched Christians throughout my life, and it is so sad when they lose hold of God, become degraded. It was not long before the poison had spread like a deadly infection through the camp of Israel. Those who would have conquered their enemies in battle were overcome by the wiles of heathen women. The people seemed to be infatuated. The rulers and the leading men were among the first to transgress. Can you believe it? And so many of the people were guilty that the apostasy became national 
Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. How sad. When Moses was aroused to perceive the evil, the plots of their enemies had been so successful that not only were the Israelites participating in the licentious worship at Mount Peor, but the heathen rites were coming to be observed in the camp of Israel. Can you believe it? What's happening in your mind? Is your mind invaded by filthy thoughts? What a disastrous moment in the history of Israel. Hmm. The aged leader was filled with indignation and the wrath of God was kindled. God stepped into this. You know, God is a God of grace, but also a God of justice. If you are playing around with sin, you are going to get hurt. The curses of Balaam, their iniquitous practices did that for Israel, which all the enchantments of Balaam could not do. They separated them from God. What a tragedy. And once you separate yourself from God, it's dark. By swift coming judgments, the people were awakened to the enormity of their sin. Suddenly they realized what happened. A terrible pestilence broke out in the camp to which tens of thousands speedily fell a prey. God commanded that the leaders in the apostasy be put to death by the magistrates. This order was promptly obeyed. You know, while visiting here, I was saddened by the eternal loss of 24,000 precious souls. God wanted them to be saved. They lost. Please don't get lost. The offenders were slain. Then their bodies were hung up inside of all Israel that the congregation, seeing the leaders so severely dealt with, might have a deep sense of God's abhorrence of their sin and the terror of his wrath against them. All felt that their punishment was just and the people hastened to the tabernacle and with tears and deep humiliation confessed their sin. Can you see this? I'm so glad that God speaks to us and helps us to repent. Can you see them coming here, confessing their sins with tears? You know, there's always a way out of our misery, sinfulness. And that's at the tabernacle. This is with God. He's patient and forgiving. While they were thus weeping before God, at the door of the tabernacle, while the plague was still doing its work of death and the magistrates were executing their terrible commission, Zimri, listen to this, one of the nobles of Israel, came boldly into the camp, accompanied by a Midianitish harlot. What? A princess of a chief house in Midian, whom he escorted to his tent, Never was vice bolder or more stubborn. Can you believe what, you, what you're looking at? Inflamed with wine, alcohol, Zimri declared his sin as Sodom, boasting about the sin of Sodom, and gloried in his shame. Oh, what's going to happen now? You only have to yield to one sin, only one small sin, my dear friend, and the rest will follow. Confess your sins daily. Break with it. You cannot be lost one day because God will be lonesome for you. The priests and leaders had prostrated themselves in grief and humiliation weeping between the porch and the altar and entreating the Lord to spare his people. 
How often do you pray for your children and grandchildren or your fathers or mothers, friends, whoever? How much do we care for the lost? Or do we leave them to reap the harvest of pain? Be kind to ugly people and pray for them. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not give your heritage to reproach. Maybe you've got a wayward son or family member. Ask God to save them. That the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Look at what's happening. May we, like Moses and the leaders, also weep before God for the lost loved ones. Don't stop praying for them. Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the high priest, rose up from among the congregation and seizing a javelin, he went after the man of Israel into the tent and slew them both. Good for you, Phineas. Thus the plague was stayed while the priest who had executed the divine judgment was honored before all Israel and the priesthood was confirmed to him and to his house forever. I salute a man like Phineas. You know, we become so comfortable with sin. We should never be soft on sin, not the sinner. Here in the Vale of Shittim, the words of Moses came to my mind. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Elias, or the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was zealous for my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give him the covenant of peace. If you rebuke sin, the Lord says, Behold, I give to him or her my covenant of peace. We need peace. Sin destroys peace. And it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for, the, for, for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. The judgments visited upon Israel for their sin at Shittim destroyed the survivors of that vast company who nearly 40 years before had incurred the sentence, they shall surely die in the wilderness. So 24,000 of them were left, but here they were destroyed. Poor people had to go into the promised land. And then the sad news. But among these was not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest, when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. So there was not left a man of them except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Please, ladies, don't let this destructive sin keep you out of heaven. Ladies, don't break up another woman's marriage. Don't do it. Ask God to deliver you from this problem. And gentlemen, don't break up another man's marriage. Live a pure life. God had sent judgments upon Israel for yielding to the enticements of the Midianites. But the tempters were not to escape the wrath of divine justice. Can you recall what happened here at Rephidim? The Amalekites who had attacked Israel at Rephidim, falling upon those who were faint and weary behind the host, were not punished till long after. 
So we're going to meet the Amalekites again. You know, God is, is such a, a merciful God, a long-suffering God. But the Midianites, who seduced them into sin, were speedily made to feel God's judgment as being the more dangerous enemies. They had to be punished immediately. Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. Afterward, you shall be gathered to your people. Moses, there's another job for you, and then you can go to sleep. Take vengeance upon them. You know, discipline is so important. Even in the churches, we have to stand up and say, this is wrong. This command was speedily executed. A thousand men from every tribe went to war under the leadership of Phineas. And they warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. The five kings of Midian, Balaam the son of Beor, they also killed with a sword. Can you imagine what happened here? At the ruins of Carchemish, I thought of Balaam who destroyed himself. But he also destroyed many thousands because of his selfishness. Your selfishness may destroy other people. Be unselfish. The woman also who had been made captives by the attacking army of Israel were put to death at the command of Moses as the most guilty and the most dangerous of the foes of Israel. Such was the end of them that devised mischief against God's people. In the museum, I took a picture of these weapons of war. The Israelites, who could not be overcome by the arms or by the enchantments of the Midianites, fell a prey to their harlots. Harlots will always be in business. Such is the power that women enlisted in the service of Satan has exerted to entrap and destroy souls. Shame. Here David stumbled. And Solomon, the wisest of kings, who had thrice been called the beloved of his God, became a slave of passion and sacrificed his integrity to the same bewitching power. My friend, if you are sinning in this respect, ask God to deliver you. It's going to destroy you. 36 people suffer during one divorce. Don't do it. It's not necessary. All along through the ages, there are strewn wrecks of character that have been stranded upon the rocks of sensual indulgence. What does typology teach us? As we approach the close of time, and it's here, as the people of God stand upon the borders of the heavenly Canaan, Satan will, as of old, redouble his efforts to prevent them from entering the goodly land. He lays his snares for every soul. This is going to be the last great temptation. And we see this in the churches. When I studied theology many years ago, the figure was 20% of clergymen are involved in the adultery. This figure is rising. So I speak to my dear colleagues, please ask God to deliver you from the sin. It is not the ignorant and the uncultured merely that need to be guarded. He will prepare his temptations for those in the highest positions. You hear this over the news high positions, in the most holy office in the church. If he can lead them to pollute their souls, he can through them destroy many. 
Sensual indulgence weakens the mind. Do you want a weak mind? Carry on. And debases the soul. Do you want a debased soul? The moral and intellectual powers are benumbed and paralyzed by the gratification of the animal propensities. This is what you're doing to yourself if you're involved in this kind of sin. What a serious warning God sends us. Please listen. And he's willing to forgive you if you've got a problem. Goodness, purity and truth, reverence for God and love for sacred things, all those holy affections and noble desires that link men with the heavenly world, are consumed in the fires of lust. Are you a victim of vice? Is there hope for you? Yes. The soul becomes a blackened and desolate waste, the habitation of evil spirits and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Beings formed in the image of God are dragged down to the level where the brutes, the sensuals, don't become an animal. It was by associating with idolaters and joining in their festivities that the Hebrews were led to transgress God's law and bring judgments upon the nation. How sad. So now it is by leading the followers of Christ to associate with the ungodly and unite in their amusements that Satan is most successful in alluring them into sin. Can modern amusements and video games leave a scar on my spiritual profile? What else can empty my literal and spiritual purse? Do you like to take a guess? Gambling. Is there hope for people who gamble themselves into bankruptcy at the casinos of sin? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you so we can flee to the rock that is higher than I. A long preparatory process unknown to the world goes on in the heart before the Christian commits open sin. Watch out what you think you may do. The mind does not come down at once from purity to corruption and crime. It takes time to degrade those formed in the image of God to the brutal or the satanic. Is there danger in using internet, looking at certain websites, pornography? God wants you to be clean. The opera with its fascinating display, bewildering music, the dance, rock music, the casino, Satan employs to break down the barriers of principle and open the door to sensual indulgence. Where pride is fostered, Appetite indulged, where one is led to forget God and lose sight of eternal interests. There, Satan is binding his chains about the soul. Proverbs 4.23 Keep your heart with all diligence, that's the mind. For out of it spring the issues of life. What you think you do, what you think you are. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Cultivate good, pure thoughts. The heart must be renewed by divine grace, or it will be in vain to seek for purity of life. He who attempts to build up a noble, virtuous character, independent of the grace of Christ, is building his house upon the shifting sands of life. In the fierce storms of temptation, it will surely be overthrown. 
David's prayer should be the petition of every soul. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I stood here at David's tomb. Have you read his history? You know, the God who forgave David is waiting for us to come and receive the precious gift of forgiveness as well as the power to resist temptation. And having become partakers of the heavenly gift, we are to go on unto perfection. Like Peter says, being kept by the power of God through faith. Kept by the power of God through faith. Believe that he can deliver you. What is the Lord expecting from us? Yet we have a work to do to resist temptation. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. Make a decision to discard everything that would defile you. The mind should not be left to wander at random upon every subject that the adversary of souls may suggest, girding up the loins of your mind, says the Bible. Peter says, be sober, but like as he which called you is holy, be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living. If the sands of the Vale of Shittim could speak, and here we're looking at the sands, they will tell you how thousands of willful sinners died right here. They, they only had to cross the Jordan River to step onto the Promised Land. And remember type and anti-type? We should learn lessons from what happened here. Besides the physical sin of harlotry, there is also the theological harlotry. If you know what is God telling you in his word, and you know what to do, but refuses, you've got a problem. How were transgressors saved? I tell the camera crew here at the Jordan River, as sinners fled on that fatal day to the tabernacle and found salvation, we too are invited to come to Jesus to find salvation. Father, you know our hearts. If we have defiled ourselves, please forgive us and give us the strength to flee from any kind of sensual temptations and save us in Jesus name. Amen.